You know, that wasn't an All-Ireland winning performance. Probably should have won the game based on their second half performance. Is it a step too far to say it was the performance so far of the World Cup? Maybe not. OTBAN's performance rankings with Gillette. I'm, I'm, I'm scratching my head. That performance is we've just lacked that intensity. OTB AM is brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. Every week we're giving away a Gillette Labs shaving kit and to be in with a chance of winning, just let us know who you think should make the performance rankings. The best place to enter is the Off The Ball Instagram page. You'll see the comments box on our story every Sunday evening. Nathan, you are guiding us through these this morning. We'll go from uh, the bad right way through to the good. So where are we starting? I'm in your seat on, there's a lot of pressure. We're going to start in the red, GAA scheduling. Sky Sports couldn't distance themselves quickly enough from the scheduling of the two qualifiers in Crow Park on Saturday. I couldn't find an official attendance figure but it looked to be abysmal and there is no place worse in the world than Crow Park in a not even half empty was it a quarter full it really didn't feel like it and it was nonsensical we all knew this was going to happen we all knew this from last Monday when these fixtures were scheduled why are you dragging these four counties to Dublin, an assumption that the Mayo supporters will travel no matter what. Like, we are in a fuel crisis. The price of petrol has never been higher. It's impossible to get a hotel in Dublin on a weekend like this. There was what, Dermot Kennedy on Friday night? So Duran Duran was on last night. We had Ireland against Scotland on Saturday as well. And the expectation that these supporters will just keep on travelling with all the expense involved for a match at Crow Park that was, was never going to take off. Why not have this in Tullamore or Port Leash or even the Hyde Park or somewhere where you have 20,000, 25, maybe even you get 30,000 where people can just rock up for the day, park up, pay their fiver in the field. But to have it in Crow Park has backfired yet again. And even from a male point of view, I could tell towards the end of last week, I didn't know anyone travelling up. And I don't think that was uh, in a, well, we presume that Mayo will win, though I think there was a bit of, well, you know, if Mayo do win, they're going to be back here in two weeks' time and there might be an All-Ireland semi-final as well to come quickly after that. And also, Mayo have been in Dublin to play Dublin in the league. Uh, they've been in Dublin for the league final. And now they're back again. And, listen, it, it was clear the Mayo players were very keen to play in Crow Park and the management were happy with that, but it, it needs to be about more than that. It, it needs to be about what the... Like, dragging Clare supporters up. Like, Clare supporters, more of them deserve to see that victory, like a momentous victory. And I know it was important for them to win in Crow Park and all of that, but we've got to get this right. We cannot. It's, it's killing the product. Like, these are big games. These are final round qualifiers. These are important matches that should be played with an atmosphere. And we saw the benefits of that yesterday yeah. with Tyrone and Armagh in Clonus, which again is a big stadium. Uh, you know, can hold, what, up in 40,000 in Clonus. But when you have a stadium that is nearly full, like, it, it, it was it was enjoyable to watch on TV because it felt like it meant something, whereas obviously the two games on Saturday meant the exact same, but it didn't feel like it. Yeah, yeah, d definitely. Like, I, I do think obviously that, that there's obviously something going on here that they need to get games played in Croke Park. I'm not sure is it down to maybe people who have premium tickets who need to have a certain amount of games every year or something like that, or they're trying to, to claw some of those games back for those patrons, if we can call them that, after after COVID, maybe. Maybe that's one of the... Ex like, like things that you could use to explain it but I don't think these games should be played in Croke Park but nor should the quarterfinals be played in Croke Park like if Mayo come out of the hat this morning and draw a Kerry or a Dublin maybe Dublin you play that in Croke Park but it, do, do you really want to, to play that Kerry game in, in Croke Park is there you know a certain other provincial ground that famously held a game between those two that would give you a better uh, 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 atmosphere uh, and I think that goes for all those potential matchups I think maybe the only possible matchup in that quarter final that you'd really want to see in Croke Park is, is Mayo against Dublin everything else would be better served by being outside of Croke Park what I will say but there's is that going to be if whoever Dublin get whoever Dublin get is going to be in Croke Park Yes, well, sorry, they're all, all four games going to be in Crow Park. Park. But again, it doesn't make any sense, like dragging Derry down if it's <coughs> Derry against Armagh, having that in Crow Park. Yeah, well, we, we know it's going to be fixed for, for Croker. That's not going to change. That's definitely where the games are going to happen the weekend after next. Uh, Jared Markham has been in touch to say they bring the, the hurling quarterfinals at Hurlis, which should be in Croke Park, and now there will be a scramble for tickets. Like, I mean, are they? Um, I think the situation with that is, I think, is better than the football where you do have two cracking games on uh, the only issue there is that they're on the same ticket isn't it like, well, what's the problem with there being a scramble for tickets but like well. you could just play them on separate days like there's a double header in, in Thurlis one at 145 one at 345 this Saturday could you potentially have played one of them on Sunday I may be missing something there in terms of you know you've got the 
I, th- I think the, the minor game is actually on the Gaelic grounds on, on Saturday and maybe there's a, a mi- another minor game on in Semple on Friday as well. I'm, I'm not sure what the makeup is there. Maybe there's a reason for having them back to back and uh, and maybe it's because they want to keep the Talton Cup semi-finals in their own place on Sunday. But anyway, that's kind of like a, a small conversation around that. I think third is for the semi for the quarterfinals and the hurling is really good. What, what I did take away from Saturday though is that what we did get were actually two really good games that I really enjoyed and yes you can absolutely feel a lack of atmosphere from the stadium but you do kind of forget about it when you're saying oh hold on here Claire have a penalty in injury time you do forget about it when the second half of Mayo versus Kildare is just unbelievably chaotic it wasn't necessarily packed with quality but it was mad it was absolutely mad it was as mad as Newbridge was in 2018 as a television not as a television spectacle but as a as a game and you do forget about that for a minute and I do genuinely believe that the four games that we got the weekend of football that we got was the best of the year and it, it's a bit unfortunate that I guess one of the, the main things about it is that there'll be a lot of Mayo fans and a lot of Clare fans and to be fair it goes for um, the Ross Common fans as well that just didn't make the journey because you know they live on the other side of the country and it's just bloody expensive to go up and watch a game in a cavernous stadium um, but at least the Kildare fans I guess were sort of relatively well <laughs> which is a, all that matters were they? they enjoyed their day out? yeah yeah, they certainly right. did. We, we'll come back to this in just a moment uh, because we'll get stuck into Mayo and the games. But uh, second up in the red in our performance rankings this morning is uh, regarding the URC. Yes, the URC final, the one we've all dreamed of, the Bulls <laughs> against the Stormers. Yeah, a bit of a shock to the system for Irish rugby over the weekend. Uh, Leinster beaten on Friday night. Ulster just about edged out on Saturday and... Uh, quite the post-mortem, I would expect, for Leinster after this game. Nobody was quite expecting. I think uh, the Bulls were maybe 14-1 to 1, uh, to beat Leinster. So it was a heck of a shock. And while it was a one-point game in the end, the game was obviously done uh, quite a few minutes before that. And Leinster end the season uh, trophyless for, what, the first time in five seasons? Uh, question marks about their physicality again after a couple of years against Saracens, a couple of years now against La Rochelle. Uh, that the arrival of the South African teams into the URC and now from next season into the Champions Cup as well, that Leinster need to find something different. It was interesting listening to Leo Cullen after the game describing it as squeeze rugby, admitting yeah. that they were outpowered, but said it's not really in our DNA. And that's a conversation that's going to have to happen in Leinster over the course of the summer because it's not. They score an insane amount of tries on those regular Friday night URC games where... Yeah, I think most people have felt that the URC hasn't served Leinster pretty well because they've been so far ahead of everybody else, uh, scoring over, what, four tries on average in every single URC game this season. But do you now have to alter your plans because of the arrival of the South Africans? And I think that's already in train. Like, I've rarely seen Leo Cullen as excited as when he's been talking about Jason Jenkins coming in. And you know, a lot of people would think Jason Jenkins is not exactly a superstar, but he is a big, big boy and... Leo Cullen obviously sees something there that he's going to be able to be an impact player in matches like this. Uh, but yeah, maybe a bit of a shock for Leinster, for Irish rugby in general, what's gone on over the last few weeks. I think the URC is in green, though, after those. Uh, like anybody winning as a 14-1 to underdog in a semi-final represents a good competition. The drama at the end of the Ulster game is absolutely mad. I think it's the Irish provinces, really, that should be in the red this morning. What you have all of a sudden now next year is Leinster going up against the South African teams with a sense of narrative around it. That just didn't exist over the last little while because these rivalries were brand new. The rivalries did not exist. And now all of a sudden you've got a team who are kind of ripping the Leinster game plan apart a little bit and and saying this is how we're going to beat you and doing so successfully. Like Colin did say that there was a commonality between the La Rochelle defeat, the Saracens defeats and now uh, the the defeat at the weekend as well. So there is a, a theme emerging here that we thought had been corrected somewhat by Leinster this year but it clearly hasn't and I mean they'd completed the signing of Jason Jenkins long before these defeats started to happen for them Mm. so maybe even inside the camp they realised that there was a little bit of extra work they needed to do in terms of heft but it is a little bit deja vu isn't it this conversation that we have around Irish rugby where I know it's not Ireland but it is essentially Ireland uh, Leinster getting beaten in that way over the last little while and just this question of, of, of heft and maybe New Zealand won't be a rude awakening for the Ireland rugby team this summer maybe Ireland might win a test down there uh, next month but it does feel that the last couple of weeks have been a little bit of a an edging towards the alarm button uh, when it comes to, to Irish rugby the sort of concerns that people would have had around the power you know they haven't gone anywhere 
and it would be very very interesting to see what would happen if, if Ireland came up against a South Africa uh, in, in the morning for example would these well, they will uh, later in the year so we get a, a proper uh, sense of it then uh, like a question of the heft and I think listening to Bernard Jackman as well a question about the depth of this Leinster squad uh, they used up on 60 players this season and you know I often feel this when we're doing the depth chart around Ireland as well like real depth is that you can replace one player with another player and there's not a great difference in quality and it seems from looking at the way Leinster have used that squad over the last week that maybe the management aren't convinced that there isn't a big difference in terms of quality uh, Bernard Jackman outlined it just in the pay-per-view the amount of players in the pack who are coming on just too late in games like in the last couple of minutes where you're just throwing them on whereas you compare it to La Rochelle who had a you know, set game plan in advance to say exactly when they were going to make their changes to the pack so why don't Leinster trust these players uh, questions as to why Devon Toner wasn't playing and considering the problems they've had in the line out and even though he's leaving the province was a decision made because he's on his way out that we're you know somehow we're still building towards the future here uh, so yeah there's a lot of players in that Leinster squad who we think are set for superstardom, but again, maybe we've all just got a bit carried away with some of these younger players. I would be curious to see as well if Leinster had beaten La Rochelle, which could easily have happened, and had they got through Friday night, would we be having these conversations at all? And I'm sure... that's. But that, that, that is the reason we're having them is that these are the defining games of your season, that part of the problem with the URC has been that Leinster wins so, matches, so many matches so comfortable, it's hard to judge exactly where they are. So these are the games where those young players have to perform. And you know, Sexton is on the bench on, on Friday night. Like, does it underline again that Sexton has to start these big games? Is it a real concern again that if Sexton's not there, that Ross Byrne, that Harry Byrne, that they're still not ready to go and take a game like this, a, a semi-final in the URC and to control it? So I think it, it'll leave a lot of questions for Leinster. Not that the players have much time to uh, think about this. I'm sure a lot of them will be in Andy Farrell's squad and they're flying out either next Sunday night or next Monday to New Zealand. So there's not too much time uh, to lick their wounds. Edward Freeman has been in touch to say Leinster weren't overpowered on Friday. Their scrum was stronger. The problem was the line-out was cleaned out and they couldn't get any decent possession in the second half. Which is interesting when you listen to the squeeze rugby comment from Leo Cullen that he did kind of accept that analysis yeah. that there, there is a little bit of a, a strength conversation there and he actually referred back to the Lions tour of last summer when this was a real topic of conversation around every match was you know th this is the way rugby is played at the moment South Africa were leaders at it it may not be pretty but get used to it it's winning rugby and I think that he was kind of alluding to that and on Friday night himself and MOC says the tour to New Zealand looks like a damp squib now <laughs> James Ryan is not a captain and Dave Cos says Leinster hubris are the champions. We'll be getting Alan Quinlan's thoughts and all of that at around uh, 10 to 9 this morning. Uh, most importantly though, we have got Mayo covered this morning on the performance rankings. They're in amber, Nathan. I'm going to put Mayo in green till, you know, it finally happens. <laughs> They're just going to stay in orange. Uh, they were in orange last Monday. They're in orange this Monday. And uh, understandably so because you know, they have progressed once again. They have managed to win another qualifier against another decent team uh, but have done so probably raising more questions than answers. Um, this wasn't a vintage Mayo performance. Uh, it's been probably put up there as one of their worst performances in Crow Park. It's still, they managed to come through and win that game. And even, even when Kildare were in total control, there's always that sense with Mayo that a bounce is coming, that they will somehow grind their way through this. So uh, I'd be interested to hear what Anthony Moyes thinks. I don't know anyone who quite knows where Mayo are right now. It doesn't feel as though they're anywhere near as where they've been over the last decade, yet they're back in an All-Ireland quarter-final once again. And I think a huge amount depends on the draw. The way the draw's worked out, Mayo can't play Galway. So you know, there's two out of three chance they end up against Kerry or Dublin in a quarter-final, which then means in all likelihood you have to play the other one in a semi-final. And whichever team ends up in that position, or whichever two teams end up on that side of the draw, you know, it's it's a huge challenge to beat one, never mind to go and beat the two of them in back to back games. So Mayo need to find something. Like the only reason I think anyone has belief still in Mayo, it's not based on the performances over the last couple of weeks. It's just that they've always managed to find a way over the last decade to win games, to grind it out. And even going back to the Galway match, again, where, you know, they were so poor for 45, 50 minutes, when the stakes were at their highest, they played their best football in those last 10 minutes of the game, all right, missed a kick at the end to, to get a draw and send it to extra time. But when, when it really matters in the closing stages of the games, they still seem to be able to pull out their best football. But it needs to improve rapidly because if you end up against Derek, Dublin or Kerry, 
that game will be over at half time. I just uh, predicting a draw is a really stupid thing to do, but I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway and predict that Mayo are going to draw Derry this morning, and it's going to be Mayo against Dublin or Kerry in the final, and it'll be the the same as it ever was, and Mayo will find their way to the final once again. I take it on. I take it right now. I, I take beaten. it. So the big question I have for you is that uh, in April 2020, you put Cora Staunton, Lee McHale, Kevin Kilbane, and Kieran McDonald on your Mayo Mount Rushmore. How close is Lee Keegan to knocking one of them? off that mountain well I, I did the first Mount Rushmore mm-hmm. and uh, mistakes were made mistakes were made <laughs> let's, let's hold our hands up there I, I was probably too personal about it I, you know Lee McHale was my favourite Mayo player growing up I heard Mossy Quinn say he's Mayo's greatest ever player and I think most people would agree uh, that he probably is now Mayo's greatest ever player you know Kieran MacDonald is I don't want to say he's just a cult hero because he was way way more than that and maybe he's Mayo's most skillful ever player But I think what Lee Keegan has achieved on big occasions in all Ireland finals, uh, how he has been able to play his own game all the time and counter the man he's marking, and the longevity that he's had as well, and to still be, it seems, at the absolute peak of his powers at this stage, uh, he has to be up there. Uh, And I think it's probably, I think it's probably a done deal now that Lee Keegan is Mayo's greatest ever player. Yeah. Wow. That's. uh... You've heard it here, so that that is changing your Mount Rushmore. Then that is uh, like love Lee McHale, though. Yeah. Still love Lee McHale, of course. But you see, Lee, Lee, in terms of Mount Rushmore, obviously McHale, McHale got in because of the basketball and the football. So what we're what we're coming to is Kilban. I'm gonna have to think about this. <laughs> and sorry, one last question then. Who who do you want at half eight this morning? Derry. You want Derry? Okay, absolutely. absolutely. Was that a, was that a stupid question? I mean, the Derry the Derry people here. Would well, the be, draw is it's it's it's. Similar to, uh, was it the 2018 World Cup where suddenly around the quarterfinal stage everyone looked, or even the last 16 stage went, whoa, all of the strongest teams are on one side of the draw and a lot of the mid-ranking teams are the other. So we're going to get a team that nobody at the start of the season was really expecting in an All-Ireland final there. So depending on how this draw goes, like we will obviously know exactly what the run through for the rest of the season is, that if you end up on the opposite side to Dublin and Kerry, and this isn't being disrespectful because all these teams... You feel seem on a similar-ish level, and maybe Mayo even aren't on the level of, of Galway and Derry right now. Uh, but I think any team that sees themselves on the other side of the draw to Dublin and Kerry will feel there's a massive opportunity to squeeze themselves into an All Ireland final. I think if you manage to get Mayo, Derry, Armagh, and Galway on the one side of the draw, all of those four counties will be thinking middle of July we're, we're going to the All-Ireland final there'll be an absolute chance for them and that's that's like a, a brilliant element of, of what's happened over the last little while that it is a little bit lopsided uh, C-Mark's been in touch to say why are Clare footballers not in green joke and I mean Keelan Sexton should probably be in the green for his performance 1-1 in the last five minutes well I don't, I don't know how you Hell go about a this I, I have to apologise obviously on this is your gig at the performance mm. that you never ever get wrong Yeah, uh, and I got absolutely hammered last week because I didn't have the Munster hurling final in green <sighs> There was a good game of hurling that you didn't compliment. I, You're not allowed to do that. I, I apologise. Rule, rule number one of performance hurling rankings, people. always give hurling uh, credit. I, I thought, you see, that what happened with the performance ranking is you put in all the stuff that we weren't going to talk about later. So I left out Claire and I left out Armagh out of green because I assume we're going to talk about them in depth yeah. with Anthony Moyles a little bit later. And neither of them deserve to be an orange. Mayo deserve to be an orange. They, they do. Mayo are the, the living embodiment of orange. Uh, Shane says, why is Donegal not in the red? Very good question as well, Shane. Donegal, one of the most, I would say one of the greatest underachievers over the last few years in, in Gaelic football, but the players that they have, even yesterday, there was kind of like a an underachievement within the game. The, the madness of, of their collapse is, is actually spectacular. We, we will dive deep into it a little bit later on with, with Anthony Miles, but their story since that 2014 semi-final win against Dublin has been pretty interesting like they've never made it back to a semi-final since that point and you really do feel that that's a team with the quality to be back into the semi-final and maybe even make it to a final and perhaps they are the example of why the provincial championships really are screwed is that they've had a, a tougher path than most every single year and they've suffered as a result of it maybe not maybe it's it's all internal and maybe they could have done a lot more themselves to, to try and get over the line in, in a couple of those big games over the last little while uh, and then really the only other thing to mention from the Gelly Football Weekend is of course Armagh which we'll get to a little bit later on I think if Armagh come out of the the, the bowl on the side of Galway and Derry this morning I think Green O'Neill is in the conversation for Footballer of the Year because I think there's a very, very real chance 
that he'll make it to a final if they come out on that side of the draw. I'm not saying they will make it, but there's a very good chance. David Clifford. Uh, well, I think that there's every chance that David Clifford gets taken out in an All Ireland quarter final or semi final potentially. Semi final. Oh, this is proper good proper so era ism even ahead of the draw. You're you're saying that the other four the four counties in this draw are so cynical they're going to try and take David Clifford out of the game. Yes, let's go with that. Yeah, that's that's exactly what outrageous I said. Outrageous slur. Uh, I, it's I, outrageous. I I, th- <laughs> I, th- I think that there's just a just a live possibility if if, if you're uh, if you're looking if you're looking to predict footballer of the I'll year. Take David Clifford I, out. I of think game. Wait, wait till you wait till you see half half eight and see if uh, if Reno O'Neill gets the it get managed to, to avoid uh, Dublin and Kerry. I think there's a chance he could uh, be the footballer of the year this year, but you know it's just an outside outside shot. Uh, we've got a couple of things to go through in the green because there were some good news stories in the weekend, Nathan. Yes, Rory McIlroy in the green victory last night at the Canadian Open. He won it in 2019. It was cancelled for a couple of years because of COVID, so it's actually the first time he's ever defended a title and it was a brilliant final round it couldn't have worked out better in terms of entertainment for the PGA Tour who are in the midst of this war with Liv Golf and they couldn't have a better front man right now than Rory McIlroy who as well as being still I think the biggest star relevancy wise with Tiger Woods not playing much golf uh, has also sort of become this moral champion for golf and it seems to sit very comfortably on his shoulders Uh, on the golf they had a final pairing of Justin Thomas, Rory McIlroy and Tony Finau, so three huge names and the scoring was incredibly low. At one stage it looked like Justin Rose may shoot the first ever 57 on the PGA Tour and the end he had a bogey on 18 for a 60. McIlroy and Thomas shot the lights out again. At one stage we thought both of them might be going for a 59 and McIlroy over that closing stretch of five or six holes there were some nervy moments particularly uh, as he sort of went down 15 16 his driving started to let him down hit a couple of drives way left uh, missed a couple of three footers on the green but his wedge play was exceptional all week and particularly yesterday it's an area of his game that a lot of people have felt has held him back hugely over the last couple of years that when he's anywhere sort of between 125, 160, 70 yards, that he's just not close enough. And that when you look at his putting stats, actually, part of the issue is that he's just leaving himself with too much to do in the greens compared to other top players. But on 17 and 18, he more than delivered the goods. And throughout yesterday's round, his wedge play was as good as I've ever seen uh, from McElroy. And he just about held off the challenge of Justin Rose, or Justin Thomas, who faded and uh, made a mess of 17 and of 18. Uh, so Rory wins, which is huge from a pure golfing point of view because we are in US Open week. It's at Brookline just outside Boston. It all gets underway on Thursday. So Rory's going in on a huge wave of momentum. And he did win this, as I say, back in 2019. And he finished inside the top 10 at the US Open that year. But you would hope that actually he can go a little bit closer this time. And obviously he showed at the Masters that maybe his first round yips are out of the way a little bit. But he now has to deal with the expectation that goes with winning last night. At uh, the other side, and another reason why Rory McIlroy is, just always says the right thing. Just always says the right thing. So last night was his 21st victory on the PGA Tour, which in itself is a huge achievement. Uh, moved him past a certain Greg Norman on the all-time list. And Rory, Rory wasn't going to... You know, I thought these are the sort of stats that I like. Turns out Rory was well aware of this stat as well, Owen. Yeah, let's have a listen. Silence is the real killer for Greg Norman. It turns out that that Rory McIlroy just mic dropped. Wow! Uh, do you want to do your best Rory impression and tell us what he said? Uh, you see, if you try and do a Rory impression, you automatically end up in GMAC. <laughs> Isn't that the problem? Uh, we'll get to that clip in just a moment, but uh, let's just say it was a bit of an incentive for Rory McIlroy that he was in a position to go one clear of Greg Norman's co- career uh, winnings of. Uh, I couldn't believe you. I could. I, I, I don't know why I'm surprised because uh, this this has been. Uh, Rory, he'll always say uh, what's on his mind and uh, won't really worry about the consequences too much, but it was just, oh, like it was a complete shots fired moment. You try that clip again? Amanda, it's all yours. Rory, on a week where you have emphasized how important it is for you to play against the world's best, what does this win in this scene mean to you? Yeah, it's, um, it's incredible. Uh, you know, playing with Tony and JT today, two of the top players in the world. And I'm 
all of us playing the way we did. I mean, I think the worst score of the group was, whatever, six under par. Um, yeah, this is the day I'll remember for a long, long time. Uh, 21st PGA Tour win, uh, one more than someone else. Uh, that gave me a little bit of extra incentive today, and I'm um, happy to get it done. Justin Thomas as well was tweeting with uh, a winky face after the number 21 as well on uh, on Twitter yesterday. So you can imagine the conversations that are have, that are being had behind closed doors between like the likes of Justin Thomas and Rory McIlroy about Greg Norman at the moment. Today though, the big thing, I think 6 o'clock, Phil Mickelson is in front of the press, 6 o'clock Irish time. That is going to be pretty interesting because he doesn't necessarily always do media before majors, cer- certainly early in the week. And there's only going to be one thing that people are going to be asking him about. And this seems to be quite a, a pinch point as well. The, the majors and the acceptance of live golfers at the majors. This is going to be a very interesting couple of days of a build-up to Brookline. Well, everybody's on a bit of a high who feels that the best player should stay in the PGA Tour because of having such a brilliant finale to the Canadian Open. Uh, even the scenes with the crowd gathered around the 18th green, the chance of ole ole, just in stark contrast to what we saw in England yesterday or uh, on Saturday for the final round of live golf where it just felt like a complete irrelevance. People had lost interest by the time it got to Saturday. Charles Schwartz had actually won and won four million quid first prize, the biggest first prize in the history of golf. But I think when things start to settle down, you know, it's been a good week for Live Golf in terms of their aims to basically take over the game of golf. Uh, they got through the first week, yeah, uh, with some teething problems. And some, Phil Mickelson could be interesting because every press conference so far has been a bit of a shit show, let's be honest. Uh, you know, Gray McDowell has done himself what feels like irreparable damage with what he has had to say over the past couple of weeks. But the likelihood is that by the time they get to Portland, Oregon, at the end of June for the next Live Golf event, that they could have 16, 17, 18 of the top 50 in the world. So you have a massive split and you are less likely to have the type of scenes that you had last night where you have the best players in the world in the final group. Now, at the moment, it doesn't look as though any of the top 10 in the world are going to go, and maybe, maybe all the negativity will have an impact. Like Harold Varner, who's not a huge name, he's top 50 in the world rankings, uh, was one of those who was initially seen to be a definite to go to live golf. There have been a lot of reports that you know, he's having second thoughts now because he's seen the backlash that has come towards the players and probably doesn't want that moment where he has to sit in front of the media and give that explanation as to why he's taking this money. But the PGA Tour haven't responded to this in a particularly strong way. Yeah, they came out and they banned the players and said anyone who goes isn't going to be welcome on the PGA Tour. But that was sort of the least they could do. And part of their problem is it's, it's not a fair fight here. Like They can respond by trying to increase prize money, and I'm sure they will. And you know the rich will get richer on the PGA Tour as well, as they have done already over the past 24 months because of the interest from Live Golf. But Live Golf have invested one, two billion on this, and they don't look like they're going to slow down. So the PGA Tour if Liv Golf decide to go and offer Rory McIlroy 500 million, which you'd imagine he will, the only thing they can rely on is that Rory McIlroy morally doesn't want to go and take that money and feels that his legacy is built on the PGA Tour. And we've now seen them go down a different route. Jay Monaghan, who's the commissioner, has been interviewed last night and was going down the patriotism route. So mm. it came out in the middle of last week that the 9-11 Families Group uh, had written a letter to all the top US stars asking them not to play in this because of the uh, strong Saudi connections to 9-11. And Jay Monaghan, basically that was uh, his main point in his interview last night to try and keep players was, have you ever had to apologize for being a PGA Tour player? And I went down the route of I know families. I've had friends who lost people in 9-11. And these are difficult conversations to have. So to try and tug in the heartstrings of these players. But it seems clear that anyone I've heard who played in live golf, like there isn't a ounce of remorse or regret or consideration for anything but the amount of money that they're getting. And like Phil Mickelson did a press conference last week and sort of laughed his way through things. I would expect it'll be something similar. And like this week's going to be fascinating in some ways. Like, will there be... I can't imagine there will be. Like, would there be any way, bit of a negative reaction towards Phil or Dustin Johnson? And also, there's a you know, there's definite possibility that one of the live golfers wins the U.S. Open. Like Dustin Johnson is still one of the best golfers in the world right now. Uh, maybe Dustin Johnson can go and win this week. And what will that mean for that? <laughs> that would be uh, quite the scene. A few people in touch. Uh asking about if live players are allowed to play at the US Open, that they are this, this week. They are for now, they are this year. Uh, they said, listen, we don't feel that as a US Open, uh, we should change our rules for players who have qualified, but I think they've left it, left it open. And listen, Live Golf uh, you know, may have weighed this up and looked at the four majors 
and thought, are they going to unify in a stance alongside the PGA Tour? At the moment, it doesn't look like they will. There's been no indication, uh, really, from the PGA Tour or from the majors that they will ban the players from Live Golf. And, you know, there's a lot of speculation as to what's going on with the European Tour. Uh, we still don't know. We haven't heard at all from the European Tour. So this is going to run and run. But while it was a very, very good night for the PGA Tour and a reminder of how great the PGA Tour can be, it's not a perfect entity in any way, but it gives us that brilliant Sunday night entertainment. And I do always feel sorry for Americans because Sunday night, it's, it's a real... Obviously, in this part of the world, it's Sunday night, but in America, it's like 4 o'clock in the evening. It's like 4 o'clock. But it's perfect Sunday night relaxation for us. So we're just on the couch having a good time watching this. They sort of miss out on that, don't they? <laughs> yeah, poor Americans. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, bloody hell. That's, I never really thought of it like that, Nathan, it turns out. Uh, the last thing in our performance rankings this morning is uh, the Republic of Ireland, which we'll stick with over the next half an hour or so. Uh, any top line from Saturday that we haven't touched on just yet that, that stuck out to you, Nathan? Uh, this was a pivotal game for Stephen Kenny. I felt ahead of kickoff that we'd know a lot as to where we were going at the full time whistle and the crowd's reaction. That if it hadn't gone well, again, there's ways of losing games, and if it hadn't gone well and Ireland had lost in disastrous fashion, if there were booze ringing out the Aviva, you know, we could be heading towards an end game pretty quickly. It couldn't have been more different from that. It was absolute jubilation. Uh, the tightness of the players was was there straight away. The second the full-time whistle went, all of them into a huddle. Uh, they went off in a lap of honour. A huge crowd stayed behind. Uh, Stephen Kenny, you know, I think he looked a little bit emotional because, again, that's not too many days like this, uh, certainly in front of a, a packed Aviva Stadium. And all around, it was, you know, it was a really good performance. There were some sloppy bits in the first half that could have given Scotland an opportunity. And if John McGinn takes one of those chances, we could be having a very different conversation this morning. But Ireland got the first goal and that really felt key to this. Yeah, it was the one scrappy goal and Alan Brown pops up in the right place again. But that just seemed to ease a little bit of pressure on everybody. And remember against Ukraine, Ireland started well in the first 15 minutes and then Armenia played well in the first 45 but couldn't score. So actually getting a goal and, and scoring three goals at home. I think it's 1989 is the last time Ireland scored three goals at home against a team ranked higher than them in a competitive game. You know, hadn't won a competitive game in three years since a match against Gibraltar. So, yeah, Scotland were great. And probably, you know, Andy Robertson was way, way off where we, you would expect him to be. And McTominay had no great influence in the game. But they're still a decent team. So this, yeah, this is a performance that Ireland need to build from now. They've got a very tough game tomorrow night against what we expect will be a full-strength Ukraine. And they're now missing, unfortunately, several players uh, from Saturday as well. But like, this, is, this is what people thought they were buying into when Stephen Kenny became manager. Young, youthful, exciting, attacking team, playing a good quality of football in possession. Like, the quality of the second goal, like, Troy Parrott's involvement gets somewhat overshadowed by Obafemi, but he goes up, he wins the initial ball. And then he doesn't just stop and wait, he makes that charging run through. And Obafemi's little dink over the top was, was just sensational. sensational. And for power to have made the run and followed up is exactly what you want. And even then, like the balls and the bravery to take on the shot for the third goal. How often have you seen an Irish attacker drop deep like that? And they take the simple option. They roll it out to the right-hand side. The cross is whipped in. It's cleared out of play. You get a corner kick and everyone's happy with that. So, yeah, I, some people will look at the playing it out from the back and say it's still a sign that Ireland are trying to do too much of the wrong thing. I, yeah. I don't think so. I think execution-wise, they got it wrong on a couple of occasions, but every team does that. You have to ask that question of the opposition. So, yeah, it was a, it was a brilliant day. Friday night, uh, Saturday night, 5 o'clock, was a perfect kickoff time, I think. Uh, the atmosphere was cracking, and you just hope that now they can, they can kick on from here because you know, they're such a, a likeable group of players that mm. you really want them to be able to put a run of games together. Yeah, and uh, a bigger test lies in wait tomorrow evening, which we'll get into in just a moment. Good stuff on the performance rankings this morning. Best done. They are uh, Nathan Murphy's performance rankings, nobody's else, and uh, we'll be back next Monday morning with them. OTBAN's performance rankings with Gillette. After the break with Gavin Cooney, live from Poland, ahead of the Republic of Ireland's game with Ukraine tomorrow night. First, though, here's Nathan in conversation with a few of the Irish stars from Saturday's win over Scotland at the Aviva Stadium, starting with the man of the moment, Michael Obafemi. 